When the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers showed up in 1993, I was a bit too old to pay it much mind. I sure knew what it was, though, because both my little sisters loved it to death. It seemed like every single day after school, they were rocking it. While I wasn't an avid fan, I had to appreciate the callbacks to Voltron, or what was giant robotic animals combining to form a huge sword-wielding warrior. Of course, the popularity of the TV show meant a video game adaptation was assured. In true 16-bit style, Sega handled the IP as publisher and created a version all its own. In fact, they created games based on the Power Rangers for the Genesis, Game Gear, and Sega CD. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers games that appeared on Sega's consoles back then, talk a bit about whether they were any good or not, and even look at the unlicensed port that showed up years later. I've got six different games to go over, so let's get started. Released in November of 1994, the Genesis version of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was developed by Nova, who was responsible for Namco's Burning Force some years earlier on the Genesis. This was a one-on-one -on -one fighting game similar to Street Fighter II, though far more simplistic in setup and gameplay. It uses just two attack buttons, a normal and a fierce, and has bog standard quarter circle and charge motions for special attacks. The one player scenario has you picking different Power Rangers and going through a story concerning Rita Repulsa and her merry band of bad guys. Storyboards precede each battle as you fight your way to the final confrontation. The flow of this is basically the same all the way through. Pick a ranger, battle on foot, and then move on to the larger robot battles. The graphics are fair and the sound is decent enough for the volume not to be lowered during gameplay. This was aimed at a younger crowd so you can imagine just how simple it is. Each ranger only has a handful of attacks and the movement is slow and cumbersome. The fighters are grossly imbalanced and there are a couple of moves that can dominate the entire game. I can definitely see kids getting a kick out of this because it's so easy to pick up and do well, but for those of you bred on Street Fighter and its like, this will be something that will likely never be played again. At least not alone. The two-player battle mode allows you to play as the bad guys as well, giving you a much wider roster and far more choice and variety. In today's climate, it's a good one to play with your kids thanks to its simplicity, but there are much better fighting games on the platform. Around that same time in November of 1994, Sega published the Orion Technologies developed Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for the Sega CD. Instead of taking the Genesis fighting game and adding new music and cinematics, this was a completely different experience. It uses full motion video from the television show as a basis for its QuickTime interface. Mash the buttons and directions as they appear on the screen. While some full motion video games could get away with this, it falls flat on its face in this instance. The video sequences play out whether you hit the right button or not, and a missed button never changes the direction of the action. It never feels like you are actually making any difference at all. Every level is going to play out the same way every single time. You do have a life bar that determines when your chances run out, and there is a scoring system here if you are into that sort of thing. It really is quite shallow overall, however. The video is full screen, but terribly pixelated. But if you know anything about the Sega CD, none of that should come as a surprise. I suppose if you are a huge fan of the IP, this could be interesting. But the gameplay, if you can call it that, is shallow as a puddle. Spend 10 minutes with it, and that's all you'll need to retire it back to the shelf for another 25 years. There was a time when Sega really did feel that this was the future of gaming, and I'll never understand it.
After the Genesis and Sega CD Power Rangers games, I was expecting the Game Gear version to be the worst of the bunch by far. Released around the same time as the other Sega versions in November of 1994, this was done by Sims, and is far better than I ever would have guessed. It's basically a one-on-one -on -one fighting game with some beat-em-up elements to make it stand out. In between the main fights, you often need to deal with scrub enemies until the story progresses. Like the Genesis version, the flow of the gameplay is based on playing the Rangers first before moving on to the more difficult Megazord battles. What really sets this one apart is its gameplay. It's faster, more aggressive, and has a ferocity to it that is far more appealing than its 16-bit Big Brother. Heck, it manages to even look and sound great for an 8-bit title, and aside from the lower resolution, is every bit as nice as the Genesis release. Aside from the story-based single-player option, there is also a versus mode that gives you access to playing as the bad guys, which itself is still accessible by one player. Add in link cable support, and this is a pretty fun portable experience, top to bottom. It has its issues with repetition, and it's short on moods, but Sega would have been better off just making an upgraded port of this to the Genesis. It's the better game by quite a bit. In June of 1995, Sega was ready for another Power Rangers release, this time following the movie based on the TV show. Seemingly understanding that Sims had made the best version of the original game, they were brought on board to do the Genesis edition as well this time. But instead of a fighting game, we got a bona fide side-scrolling beat-em-up similar to the likes of Streets of Rage and Final Fight. It's fairly simple in execution, however. As you'd expect, stages begin on foot with your ranger, and then move on to the larger battles, which serve typically as your boss encounters. You have an assortment of punches, kicks, and special attacks. You can run, which gives you a few more ways to attack, and you can throw enemies. It looks good with solid animation, and the sound and music aren't bad at all. The bones were definitely here for a halfway decent beat-em-up, but it's got some real problems with enemy variety. While on foot as your ranger, you will fight the same enemies over and over. I mean, 16-bit beat-em-ups are notorious for spitting out the same five enemy types to you ad nauseum, but Power Rangers the movie really jumps the shark by literally giving you a single enemy to fight the entire stage. This really is a shame, because it would have been so much better with a few more options. I'd also like to take a moment and mention that this has one of the most frustrating stages I have ever played in a game. There is a cave level where you fight a nearly endless supply of enemies. When you get to the end, you can't go anywhere, and the bad guys just keep coming. I believed for years that this was a glitch and that the game was broken. I don't want to spoil it completely, but the exit to the stage is actually in the background, an infuriating revelation. At only six stages, it's also fairly short and easy, and you'll have absolutely no issues seeing the ending. It does have some redeeming qualities thanks to its two-player mode, so again, will serve your youngsters quite well. It could have been a classic though, but as it is, the lack of enemy variety really hammers the replay value. Also in 1995, Sega had Sims make a Game Gear take on the Power Rangers movie. Realizing what they had before worked, they refined their engine and released what was the best Sega published Power Rangers game of the bunch. It follows the same pattern as the previous Game Gear release, but this time with an improved heads up display, even better gameplay, and it is an overall joy of a product. As before, you pick your ranger and face a sort of hybrid between a one-on-one -on -one fighter and a beat-em-up. You'll face the putty patrol before and during your more substantial enemies, and of course the Megazord comes out to end the stages. The visuals and sound are again top-notch for an 8-bit product, 
and I still feel Sega would have been better served making their Genesis releases based on this formula. The fast and aggressive gameplay from before returns with a solid variety in moves and specials. The versus mode makes a triumphant return, as does the multiplayer link options. Story cinematics link the stages of which there are just as many as the 16-bit editions. It came in at 4 mega power, just a quarter of the Genesis version, yet was a better game top to bottom. It really was an interesting lesson that size wasn't always a factor in quality, as well as gameplay truly being king when it comes to the overall enjoyment of a title. It really is something that after two years and five releases, it's the Game Gear that walks away with the most memorable Power Rangers software. The notion that Sega was spreading itself too thin really has merit when its handheld software was more desirable than its premier 16-bit and CD experiences. <laughs> In 1995, Natsume and Bandai released Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Fighting Edition for the Super Nintendo. It wasn't a great fighting game, but it was unique among the 16-bit releases. At some point in the late 90s, this version of the game was unofficially ported to the Sega Mega Drive. I can't find any concrete information on who actually did it, but for a bootleg, it's surprisingly close to the original. The pacing and hitboxes are all messed up, but it's worth looking at to see how it compares to the Super Nintendo original. You'll find it in unlicensed ROM packs or a simple Google search. Overall, the Sega Power Rangers games are somewhat of a letdown. While I had some fun with the portable Game Gear releases, the initial Genesis and Sega CD versions really left a lot to be desired. I'm not the only one to think so. The media of the time absolutely skewered these games on an epic level. The first Genesis releases were nearly universally panned by European magazines, with even the Sega-themed publications leaving little room for doubt about its quality. The Sega CD version was crushed as well, giving the platform yet another black eye for its continued dedication to full motion video nonsense. Don't get me wrong, the target audience for these games were young kids, and in that market, these were probably well liked by many of you all those years ago. If you can separate yourself enough to get away from comparing these releases to the likes of Street Fighter 2 and Streets of Rage, it's possible to have a good time. Doubly so if you have a youngster that enjoys playing with you. I think the Game Gear releases hold up best, however. They have by far the better gameplay of this group, and the sounds and visuals hold up remarkably well for an 8-bit product. One nice thing about all of these is that it was a case where the Sega versions were different from the Nintendo platforms. I always appreciated that about the 8 and 16-bit days. While everything now is copy and paste platform to platform, when you fired up each edition back then, you got something unique. For those of you that were fans of the Power Rangers nearly 30 years ago, give those Game Gear games a look. There is much more there than you may have previously believed. I'm Sega Lord X. thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.